All right, I want to continue this uh, Dharma talk on uh, uh, Metta. Buddha said one day, because don't be afraid of uh, doing wholesome things. Mabhaita bhikve punyam. Punyam. Uh, punyang etang sukhasa adhivachana, he said. Because don't be afraid of doing wholesome things. Punya, punya means uh, sometimes we translate it into English as uh, merits, uh, sometimes uh, wholesome thoughts, words, and deeds. Uh, so, popular word is uh, merits. He said, don't be afraid of doing merits or meritorious deeds. Meritor, merits means uh, merit is uh, a synonym or another name for happiness. That means merits and happiness are synonymous. And said Buddha said, don't be afraid of doing that. And this is one of the meritorious deeds. Cultivating, loving, Friendly thought, meritorious deeds. Because while cultivating these living meritorious thoughts, we are happy, we enjoy it, we become peaceful and happy at that very moment. We don't have to wait even for one second to reap the results. While we are developing it, cultivating it, that very instant, that very moment, we feel happy. So he said, therefore, with this state of mind, you speak. When we speak with the uh, loving, friendly thought, uh, we feel happy. You act with the loving, friendly thought, you will be happy. So whether it is loving, friendly thought or speech or word, at that instant, at that moment, when we engage in that particular thing, we are happy. And therefore the Buddha said, don't be afraid of doing that. By all means, at any time, at any cost, do that practice. He said, I remember Buddha said himself, I remember uh, practicing this loving, friendly thoughts for seven years. Seven years. And uh, as a result of that, I was reborn as uh, uh, Brahma for seven eons. <laughs> that is pretty long time. Seven eons he was reborn as a Brahma and became a, many times became king of deities, Sakra. And on earth I lived many, many lives in peace and happiness. See, while he was practicing it, he was happy. After death, he was happy for many countless lives. I mean, that is pretty good assurance, isn't it? <laughs> we don't have to be afraid of practicing that. Now, this loving, friendly thought can be cultivated in two levels. I, the other day I mentioned three levels. Today I'm going to mention two other levels. One is as a subject of uh, uh, tranquility meditation to make ourselves uh, very peaceful, calm and happy. I don't think there could be anybody who will not become peaceful and uh, calm, calm and peaceful when one practices this. Then, that can be used as a, a basis for gaining uh, absorption, concentration, jhana. Because when mind is uh, 
calm, peaceful, tranquil. Our um, agitation, excitement, anger, fear, all this fade away. That would help to overcome other hindrances like greed, hatred. Naturally, when we cultivate loving kindness, <coughs> loving friendly thought, our hatred will fade away. Resentment will fade away. Not only up to at that moment, but uh, for a long period of time. Because uh, mind becomes uh, differently conditioned. When we uh, speak about uh, uh, with uh, loving friendly thought about uh, about our friend, for instance, we have a friend. We love that friend very much. Even if that friend makes a mistake, we don't blow it up, and we 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 make don't make it out of proportion, and. Uh, we don't uh, slander him or slander him or her because of our deep uh, learning friendly thought we uh, either don't say anything about that about that friend's weakness mistake or we gen we just try to find out the other side of the story even if we heard something bad about our friend if we are cultivating loving friendly thought, instead of uh, uh, putting more fuel to the fire, we try to find out the other side of the story. Or we try to meet the friend and uh, talk to the friend, ask the friend to verify it. Is it true? And then, when suppose a, a, a friend made a mistake, committed an offence. So the friend would be would be regretting. At that time if uh, I as his friend also take his adversary's side, what kind of friend am I? So I say I should go to go to the friend and talk to him, try to find out uh, what happened, how it happened and I try to console the friend. When we have loving friendly thoughts we don't allow uh, negative thoughts to enter our mind with regard to our friend. We rather always try to find out a way to help our friend. So that is the kind of attitude Buddha asks us to cultivate with everybody. That is not very easy. Instead of uh, talking uh, all the ill or bad of uh, others, if we learn to cultivate uh, the wholesome, benevolent attitude towards them, with this particular wholesome thought, then we try, when we try to meditate, at that time also our loving, friendly thought becomes very, very powerful and strong, because we, in our mind there is no adversity, there is no uh, a negative, evil thought, and therefore we gain concentration. And Buddha said, that, therefore, uh, we develop our uh, concentration, gain jhanas, uh, absorption, concentration, and then using that we attain the stage, the stages of enlightenment. How? As I mentioned yesterday, this uh, loving, friendly thoughts, uh, loving friendliness, uh, compassion, appreciative, joy, equanimity and all these are conditional. So we, we, see, we see them as uh, uh, they are abhisankatang, abhisanchetaitang, they are mentally generated, created, and therefore we see them impermanent. 
seeing their impermanence, their own impermanence, one gains uh, stages of enlightenment. And Buddha said, if one does not get gain the highest stage of enlightenment, because of Dhamma Raga, Dhamma uh, Dhamma uh, Chanda, uh, Dhamma Raga, Dhamma Chanda. You know the word Dhamma Raga and Chanda both are used to clinging, craving, greed, attachment. But here, the Buddha used the word Dhamma Raga for the the uh, desire to cultivate this wholesome, friendly, loving, friendly thought. We become more and more attached to that thought. The thought of uh, loving, friendly thought, uh, loving, uh, loving friendliness. Now, becoming attached to loving friendliness itself is a wholesome state of mind. Until, of course, when one until one at, uh, until one attains enlight- uh, full enlightenment, uh, wholesome thoughts are very necessary, very important. So. Buddha said, if uh, one does not attain full enlightenment, just because of this attachment to the Dhammas, Dhamma Raga, Dhamma Chanda, here Dhamma means the, this very practice of uh, for, for the uh, sublime states, that individual will be reborn just because of that, just because of that attachment to the practice of four sublime states that person will be reborn in a, uh, uh, will become an anagami, never eternal. That is the, the, the third stage of sainthood. And uh, be born in one of those uh, five uh, pure abodes and will not never return to this world again and there they attain full enlightenment. So you can see the practice of uh, Loving friendly thoughts is uh, not only temporary cure, temporary healing uh, technique, but it it helps to heal the psychic irritants, to overcome our deeply rooted psychic other psychic irritants. And therefore, Buddha said, never be afraid of cultivating them. Never be afraid of cultivating it. However, when one is fully engaged in uh, cultivating that, what really can happen, in addition to all this, that individual's uh, attainment of enlightenment will be retarded, will be postponed, will be delayed. for instance, uh, uh, Venerable Ananda was one who was known for his uh, cultivating loving, friendly thoughts. He was very, very much uh, engaged in practicing that. When Buddha was going to uh, uh, pass away, uh, among uh, unenlightened individuals, uh, was with the Balananda and uh, uh, putting his head uh, hand against the uh, door post and putting his head on the hand, you know, covering his head like this, he started crying. Buddha has not passed away and yet uh, the very thought that he was going to pass away, this so, when the Balananda had even attained, uh, uh, had attained first stage of sainthood, stream entry, and yet, and he, he is the one who knew almost every sutra that Buddha taught. Uh, I mean, uh, there is no lack of knowledge of Dhamma to console himself. He knew every bit about impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, selflessness, and impermanence of life, and all this he knew. And yet his love for the Buddha was so deep, he began to cry 
This is my life. The Buddha is my life. This Buddha is my courage, my inspiration, my source of power, my faith, my strength. I live for him. I work for him. And now he is going to pass away. I am nobody like that. My life seems to be like dark without light. So he was crying. Then Buddha said, Ananda, come here, come. Don't you remember all these years I told you that this life is impermanent? I know you uh, physically you work with full of loving friendliness towards me. You are full of loving friendliness towards me when you are working physically. Verbally you, you work with loving friendliness. Mentally you work with loving friendliness towards me. I have no doubt about it. I know that. And that is why you feel so sad now. But don't you remember I have told you everything is impermanent? Work out for your salvation, Nananda. That is the best you can do for you and for others. So, this is the advice Buddha gave to all the bhikkhus, not only Venerable Ananda. He said, bhikkhus, if you want, when you uh, utilize, use, consume the requisites given by people. Out of love for them, out of loving friendliness towards them, use your robes properly, meaningfully, uh, and li may try to live up to the meaning of wearing your robe. Be gentle, be kind, be generous, be human, be, be soft, be, be uh, to be, be uh, full of service and uh, be honest, uh, sincere, practice your uh, Dhamma. These things you got to do in order to bring more benefits for the people who gave you this robe out of love for them, out of loving friendship, friendliness towards them. Use this robe for your own salvation, benefit, upliftment, development, cultivating your insight, your purity, your cleanliness, and your liberation, out of respect and love for the people who gave it to you. Use your seeds, shelters, houses, whatever you are dwelling in, for the same purpose, out of respect for them. Because when you are full of loving friendship, friendliness towards them, you would do anything to increase their merits. And when you use them, you will increase your own merits. He said, use the, uh, uh, the food that, you, that people give to you with the same purpose, to make them gain more merits and gain merit for yourself out of love and compassion for them. Use medicine, utensils, the same, with the same attitude. And he said, Yathapi bhamaro kuppang vanna vantang ahetayang phaleti rasamadaya evangame munichare. Go to houses villages. Just like a bee going to a flowers and without hurting its color, fragrance and tenderness, the bee extracts nectar and pollen from the flower and pollinating the flower. 
So the, the bee does two things. He gets nectar, pollen. At the same time, uh, he helps the flower to bear fruit, pollinate, by pollinating. But it does not hurt the flower, not the petals, not the color, not the fragrance. Buddha said similarly, when you associate with people, don't overload their work. Don't ask them too much from them. Don't make your life a burden to them. Telling people, I need this, I need that, I need this, I need that, that would be a great nuisance to them, a burden to them. And that you should do with out, out of loving friendly, friendliness towards them, out of compassion. Because people work very hard. They have to support their, themselves and their families. And you are an additional burden. Make it as simple as possible. Live your life, Buddha said. Live your life as simple as possible, so that the supporters can support you easily. Easily supportable. In Manga, Loving Kindness Meditation Sutta, uh, Karaniya Metta Sutta, we say uh, Subharoja. Uh, uh, Subharoja. Uh, be uh, easily supportable. Not only for our own simplicity, but also for the benefit and support for those who support us, what do you call monastics. Uh, if we make a very extravagant, luxurious requests of people, on the one hand they will get disappointed and will not we lose their support. On the other hand, it would be very hard on them. So, uh, in his uh, uh, sermons and advices to uh, all of us, he said, uh, uh, out of uh, uh, compassion towards them, out of compassion towards ourselves, we must strive very hard to liberate our mind from all psychic irritants. See, asking us to liberate ourselves from psychic irritants is not only for our own benefit, but for the benefit of all who support us as monastics. Uh, when we practice uh, loving friendliness, we learn to overcome our hatred. When we practice compassion, we learn to overcome our, uh, what do you call, cruelty, cruelty to other beings. Cruelty in thoughts, words and deeds. We can even be cruel to people by demanding too much. It is not a very kind thing to do. We may not uh, intentionally, willingly do that, but inadvertently, indirectly, we may inflict certain amount of discomfort in their mind by being too, dem by demanding too much. In other words, that is a kind of cruelty. When we uh, cultivate appreciative joy, we support them, support those who support us, uh, monastics, to live their life comfortably. And when we practice uh, equanimity, we uh, don't uh, uh, make their life more difficult when they are in difficulties. And therefore, when Buddha said, when we practice these four sublime states, 
we practice them uh, not only for our own peace of mind but even for the peace of mind of others when i say say this i remember a very beautiful story of a monk who was going uh, practicing uh, meditation and so forth was taking taking his arms ball going from house to house he used to go to one particular house every day one day after visiting the house uh, in the afternoon he would take his balls and so forth and then again visit the families just for to see their welfare and help them and so forth one afternoon he took his uh, after his meals and uh, resting and meditation and so forth he and uh, was uh, dressing up putting his robe and talking his upper robe and the bowl and so forth he was ready to go to a, a village to the village then he heard a conversation between a mother and daughter mother said to the daughter now dear your brother will come tomorrow for arms she called called uh, this man her son out of you know out of uh, respect out of affection and therefore the, he, he, she told the girl uh, he is her brother so your brother will come tomorrow to collect food make sure that you cook very delicious meal for him here is brown rice here is ghee here is honey here is the spices here is vegetables it is such and such and such and such you prepare very good meal for them for him then the daughter asked the mother mummy what are you going to do she said i am going to the woods to the forest to sit under a tree and meditate then she asked he asked her then how are you going to eat well i have yesterday's leftover rice uh, soup i can eat that that's enough for me this monk to monk heard this conversation and he told how he his heart immediately melted he began to think my goodness how can i eat this meal how can i go to this house tomorrow to get this meal this lady asking her daughter to make the most delicious meal for me and she is going to eat this is yesterday's leftover rice soup he said i'm not going to this house to get food tomorrow until i attain full enlightenment so he put his arms ball back ropes back and uh, sat down he started meditating and he meditated meditated that whole afternoon that whole night and next morning he attained full enlightenment of course he has been meditating for long period of time therefore it was not very difficult for him so next morning as he uh, promised to himself put on his robes went to the village went to that house and this young uh, woman had prepared the meal and the monk went she offered the food and that day this young woman saw this monk's uh, face so brilliantly shining better than ever so when the mother came in the evening mother asked daughter dear did your brother come uh, to get the food she said yes mummy he came he looks so beautiful today so brilliantly shining then she said he must have attained enlightenment now dear this is an example for us 
we also must work hard, strive hard to attain full enlightenment. And mother and daughter work very hard, and they also attain stages of enlightenment. Now, what this monk did to them out of compassion, out of loving friendliness. So, for this reason, Buddha asked, if you have any loving friendliness towards your supporters, this is what you have to do. When you use the requisites, use them for your own attainment of enlightenment. Now, uh, this uh, practice has many, many, many stories about uh, how uh, very benevolent uh, uh, lay people and monks uh, practice this and uh, get a lot of uh, benefit out of it. And that is why it has become so uh, central to the uh, Buddha's teaching. I like to tell you another story. This is uh, uh, I mentioned this uh, this story to people in other uh, contexts, but this uh, uh, for this uh, topic it is uh, I think more relevant. There was a meeting of monks long ago in India, and there was a ma elderly monk called uh, uh, Upa, not Upa Gutta. Uh, uh, Brahma Gutta, uh, just forgot the name. Anyway, this uh, elderly monk uh, called upon a meeting of a group of monks to make a very special, very important decision. Uh, but one monk called Rohana, he also was a meditator and had, a, had attained stages of enlightenment. And he went into uh, uh, what is called Nirodha Samapati. Nirodha Samapati is the attainment of uh, cessation of feeling and perception. Once you attain that, you don't feel anything, you don't perceive anything. You are very much like, uh, like a dead person. Do, while he was in that meditative state, the, the meeting was held and he was absent. When he returned, uh, when he came out of his uh, meditation, he mem immediately remembered, ah, today I had to attend a meeting of uh, monks. So he immediately came for the meeting and meeting was over. Then this uh, uh, elderly monk asked him, uh, where have you been? Why didn't you come to the meeting? He said, I was in uh, deep meditation. Okay, but you know that we are going to have a meeting. Now, uh, you have to undergo a punishment. He said, okay, name the punishment. He said, from now on, you go to a certain house to collect arms food. That house was uh, uh, belong, house belongs to a man called uh, Sonuttara, uh, a very uh, stingy Brahmi. You go to that house every day to collect food. 
this elderly monk knew uh, a child is born in that house. He did not tell this venerable Rohan about that. He simply asked him to go to that house to collect arms food. He went there. Then he went to the Sonuttara, the Brahmin, the owner of the house. As soon as he saw this monk, uh, gave an order to the people in the house not to give him anything, not even to look at him, not a drop of water. But this venerable Sonuttara, out of tremendous respect and loving friendliness towards his teacher, this elderly monk, he did not stop going there. He went the second day, third day, fourth day, every single day he went there, he returned empty-handed. Nothing he received from this, not even a word, nobody even looked at, looked at him. He never gave up because his, uh, his heart was so filled with this elderly monk because although it was a punishment to him, his reverence, his respect for the elderly monk was so deep, his loving friendship was so deep that he never wanted to give up. So he went. For seven years, just imagine, seven years, seven years and seven days, no, seven years and seven months, he went there. At the end of the seven years and seven month period, <coughs> uh, when he was uh, <coughs> standing in front of the house, uh, one uh, newly employed housemaid of that house did not know this the standby order. Seeing this monk, uh, Venerable Rohan, she simply turned towards him and said, uh, we have nothing to give you, go away. He went away. When he was returning, Sonutra Brahmin was returning on his horse back home. And seeing him in a very scornful, uh, sarcastic uh, tone, he asked him, uh, did you get anything from my house? <coughs> he said, uh, yes sir, thank you very much. This venerable so uh, Rohan said. Then this Brahmin Rohanustara got very upset. He thought somebody has broken the rule, the order. So he went to the house through his uh, saddle and through his boots and uh, tied the horse very quickly in the stable and ran into the house and shouted and called everybody and asked, uh, what did you give to that uh, wretched bald-headed man? Who gave? What you gave? Everybody said, we gave him nothing. Are you sure you didn't give anything? Everybody said, no, we did not give him anything. Then this Sonutra Brahmin thought, this monk insulted him. In order to insult him, he said that he received from something from the house. And he thought this monk lied to him. And he got more furious. And he was waiting. Next day he thought, let him come tomorrow. When he comes tomorrow, I will give him very mm, strong uh, scolding for lying to me. Next day he came. This man was waiting. As soon as he came in, he woke up to him and asked him, what did you get from my house yesterday? He said, sir, I came to your house seven years and seven days. Nobody even looked at me. Nobody said one word to me. Yesterday, very kind lady said to me, we have nothing to give you, go away. That is plenty. That is what I received. <laughs> that is plenty. So this man felt so sad, so sorry 
he thought, my goodness, if we gave him something, how grateful he would be. Now just hearing these words, he took it as receiving something. So this man immediately changed his mind, immediately changed the order, stand by order, asked people to give him food in his house. So every day he was invited inside the house to receive meals and eat. Now, when he was eating food like this in this house every day, there came this seven years old, seven years, seven months old boy. He started this trip to this house <laughs> when the child was born. Now the boy is seven years, seven months old, seven months and few weeks old maybe. Came out and uh, he uh, wanted to follow the monk to the monastery. And uh, Sonutra, of course, did not want this child to go to the monastery. But this child protested insisted that he should go to the monastery. So finally, he thought, well, uh, he might not stay in the monastery even uh, one day because he is a spoiled child in this uh, luxurious house. If he goes to the monastery, he might stay only a few hours, perhaps uh, one day. So next day we can go and bring him back. Next day they, they went, this child refused to return and stay in the monastery. And he wanted to learn what these monks recites. Monks were reciting sutras, dhamma and so forth. The monk said, you cannot learn these things without becoming a monk. Child agreed. They ordained him. As soon as he was ordained, this monk's punishment was ended. That was the punishment. His punishment was to bring this child to the monastery and ordain him. Now this child, when he was ordained, was given a name uh, Nagasena. And then there came a king, I think the rest of the story you know, Nagasena and uh, Milinda. In Greece, there was a king who was a disputant going from place to place, debating with people and uh, defeating them. Finally, he met this monk. Now he is an educated, young, enlightened monk, Nagasena. King Milinda came and had a debate with him. And uh, debate ended up in his being a Buddhist. Now that uh, debate is published, that is in Pali, debate is published in English also, translation, uh, called uh, Milinda Panya, uh, the questions of King Milinda. Now this, I, I, I wanted to mention this story because it is a very lovely story, this monk's loving friendly attitude towards his teacher made him go through all these difficulties for seven years and seven months and a couple of weeks. End result was a very pleasing, happy, beneficial result for everybody. Knowing this, there are every single instant, instant in the Buddha's life he mentioned the benefit of loving, friendly attitude towards uh, people as well as towards their uh, monastic uh, communities. And therefore, 
one thing even after the attainment of enlightenment what the buddha did one thing every single day is that he attained what is called uh, uh, maha karuna samapatti maha karuna samapatti maha karuna samapatti is the attainment of great compassion uh, not any other we don't know any other arahants or disciples of the buddha who had attained that attainment maha karuna samapatti in his daily schedule uh from uh, uh 4 to 5 in the morning this is what he did for one solid hour he attained to this great at at attainment of the the world to see whom he should help that particular day he was seeking uh uh people to help buddha is known as a uh, uh, physician or surgeon bisakka sallakatta bisakka is a uh, physician uh, sallakatta is surgeon so as a surgeon or as a physician he was looking for patients every morning and whenever he saw somebody needing his help he would go to him or her to help uh, that person relieve from pain and suffering so with full compassion he attained enlightenment and with full compassion he continued to work and with full compassion he went out to help uh, people so with this attitude with this uh, state of mind he advised all his disciples four four categories of disciples monks nuns men laymen and lay women to work out their salvation with this attitude in their mind towards all living beings having this compassionate loving friendly thoughts and therefore uh its effect its strength its ability is wonderful it never diminishes loving friendly attitude <coughs> does not diminish in our heart and mind as long as we maintain it with mindfulness the moment we become unmindful our uh, loving friendship friendliness can turn into greed attachment clinging play craving that is its near enemy yesterday um, i mentioned these are uh, these four uh, are uh, the conditional practices we have to guard ourselves against their enemies loving friendly uh, friendliness has the enemy of greed clinging craving attachment compassion has its near nearest enemy the cruelty thought of cruelty appreciate your joy has its nearest enemy as jealousy uh equanimity has its nearest enemy as uh, foolishness as uh, ignorance or as uh, what you call indifference indifferent attitude now uh when we develop this with mindfulness we balance it of course even the mindfulness uh, if the proper uh, equanimity is developed even the mindfulness becomes pure and clean but uh, the moment we lose mindfulness then 
uh, instead of cultivating a- equanimity, which is even more powerful than mindfulness, instead of cultivating equanimity, we may cultivate indifference, sort of very uh, neutral, uh, uh, very uh, uh, negative uh, state of mind towards very important situations. And therefore, when we cultivate this, we have to remember these uh, uh, conditions uh, and, and to keep them uh, always in balance with the practice of mindfulness. I think this will be enough for today's, today's talk and uh, we will continue it tomorrow. You may stand up and stretch and then have the meditation.